This is the third lecture, uh, pre-class lecture for Bio 410, 510, Bioinformatics at Cal State University, Monterey Bay. Um, today we're going to be talking about DNA sequencing and we're going to go over a variety of different topics related to DNA sequencing, um, particularly uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about sort of the history and the evolution of the technologies over time. And the reason why uh, it's important for us to do this is as we go through and we use data in our projects, it's very important we understand the nature of where that data is coming from. What are some of the strengths and limitations? And by understanding, you know, the process by which it's generated, we can better understand um, actually how to analyze and some of the shortcomings and, and uh, strengths of different types of data data types. Um, I'll just also preface this by saying that a lot of these slides are borrowed from my postdoc advisor, Rachel O'Neill at University of Connecticut. Um, and I've adapted a lot of them for my own purposes, but uh, she was an excellent resource for a lot of this information and a great postdoc advisor. So, power of genomics, right? These are just a few of the species um, that we could think about a wide range of different types of taxon that we're looking at these days with genomics and we use genomics as a way of understanding all of this diversity that we can see in front of us right so we think about things in terms of their phenotypic um, uh, patterns of diversity uh, differences between species adaptations all these things but in actuality uh, it's all driven by their genomes, right? And the factors that are in their genomes interactions with the environment and development and all these other things. But understanding genomics can give us incredible insight to why we see the diverse things in nature and how to understand them um, more than almost any other uh, factor that we have right now. Uh, so it's an incredibly powerful tool. It gives us insight into all these things without actually having to go in and manipulate them or do experiments on on any of these you know a lot of these endangered taxa um, so it's a it's a wonderful um, tool for us to use at the basis of that tool right is the is DNA sequencing and you know DNA sequencing quite simply is just determining the number and order of nucleotides that make up a, a given molecule of DNA right so the the target can be different types of DNA molecules um, but uh, in the end, we're interested in determining, you know, what is the sequence of these nucleotides that code these A's, these T's, these G's, and these C's. Um, and, you know, we've come a long way in our efforts to sequence things. Uh, you know, right now, if we were to look, there are uh, international... Um, initiatives, uh, the Vertebrate Genome Project and the Earth Biogenome Project, where basically they're trying to generate uh, virtually error-free, uh, complete genome assemblies for all living vertebrates and um, all organisms on Earth. It's quite the undertaking. There's about 70,000 species of vertebrates, uh, about maybe one point, around 1.5, 1.4 million species on earth right so a big undertaking um but uh, incredibly important for us understanding the the diversity and complexity of life itself so that's kind of where we're at so how did we get to that spot i mean we look at something like the vertebrate genome project and we can see that you know there's this complex pipeline of uh, that's necessary for data analysis and this has actually changed a little bit in recent times but if we think about the types of data that go in we've got pack bio data originally we had 10x data although that's gone away now um, we have bio nano data we have some type of um, high c small read data short read data um, and then we have a whole suite of assembly steps and notice that like each data type plugs in at different points of the assembly Right? And there are reasons for that, because some data, why pack bio over other types of data? Why bio nano over, over other types of data, right? Why do we need it at this step versus a different step? 
These are the issues that we face as bioinformaticians because basically each one of these data types has got its own strengths and its own weaknesses. And by understanding them and how we can plug them into all together, we can develop an established methodology for generating an, a complete error-free genome, right? For some sort of specific data outcome. So a lot of the differences that we see are due to the different technologies that underlie them. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how they came about. So um, basically we're gonna give just a little bit of background in terms of assembly, because that's the context of the problem that we'll be addressing. Um, so just we, so we have all, all the basic understanding of what I talk about when I'm talking about assembly. And then we'll talk about all these different types of technologies and kind of how they we, they move through time. Um, so let's talk about assembly first. Um, when we think about DNA sequences, we think about the lengths of DNA sequences. We go back to sort of early DNA sequencing and Sanger sequencing. You know, we had sequences that kind of ranged anywhere between 600 to 1,000 base pairs, right? That's about as long as you could go. Um, after that came the Roche 454 technology. Um, that put us at a slightly uh, lower uh, read length, maybe 300 to 800 base pairs, but we were able to generate a ton more sequence in the process of doing a sequencing run. So even though we, they were shorter, we got a lot more of them. When we talk about Aluma, uh, Lumina sequences generally are gonna be somewhere between 75 to 300 base pairs. Um, and so they're much shorter in length. But in this case, we're generating a lot more of them than either Sanger or 454 could generate. Um, the capacity of Illumina machines to generate data is truly impressive. Um, after that, we've had the, uh, there's the, the PacBio machines, uh, PacBio, uh, Pacific Biosciences, they, they have uh, sequences that generally range between 1,500 to uh, 25,000. And uh, so these are longer sequences. Uh, we, we get a lot of them, maybe not as much as Illumina, but we do get a lot off of each run. Um, so you can see that there's a, a, a slight shift in this process, right? And then we get to uh, the Oxford Nanopore Minion platform. Um, and here we start to see reads that um, could be as small as we want them to be, say 500 base pairs or so. But there have been people who have been sequencing who we affectionately referred to as whales. Um, and uh, other things, and, and you know, there have been sequences now that have been as long as a megabase or, or, or longer. So it's pretty impressive what we're able to do. Um, and then uh, that sounds all great and all, but if we think about actual genomes, you know, we think about something like a phage genome. Well, guess what? A phage genome is going to range probably somewhere between about thirty thousand, about five hundred thousand base pairs. Um, if we have a Bacterial genome, we're talking several million base pairs, you know, on the megabase, scales of megabases. And we're talking about the human genome, that's going to be, you know, over 3 billion base pairs or over 3 billion giga, uh, uh, gigabases, um, or 3 gigabases. And so, you know, what that says is I can look at all these small pieces and no matter what, you know, maybe Oxford Nanopore, uh, maybe PacBio on a tiny, tiny, tiny viral, on a, you know, very small viral genome, um, but almost none of these are actually going to be able to assemble an entire genome in and of itself in one sequence. Um, Minion is kind of our best shot for that. Um, so that means that we're going to have to think about how to assemble sequences into genomes, right? We're only going to be able to sequence part of it at a time. We can look at all these different methods, right? One thing to note, uh, this table, by the way, I will just say is out of date. You see that it's published in 2015. So especially the time to run, the number of reads produced, and the cost is probably not all that accurate, but it gives us a snapshot of how to compare these things over time. And basically what you can see is that, yeah, there's a lot of variation in size, right? There's also always been variation in error rate. Now, MinION is nowhere near 38% error rate anymore, um, but you can just see that there's going to be differences between, uh, same thing for PacBio, by the way, uh, there's going to be differences among these technologies in what those error rates are, right? And, and that has effect on us because, you know, a lot of times uh, people will look at this and they'll, you know, even though it's 2015 and the technologies have changed, they'll still think that it's the same based upon what their experiences were in the past. So 
It's important that we understand that technologies change, that there are differences between technologies. We can see that there's different amounts of data produced by them, that it takes different amount of time to generate each of these. The Oxford Nanopore data is kind of a little bit misleading because it actually does real-time sequencing and base calling. So you don't have, you, don't, you might only need the sequence as long as you need to. So that makes it even shorter. And the costs, of course, change um, at the time, for instance, um, you know, Illumina now has the, the NovaSeq, which puts out terabytes of data, um, terabases of data. And uh, so that can drop the cost of something, as well as the fact that Oxford Nanopore has increased their yields um, dramatically by, say, 20 times what they used to be. Uh, so, you know, that there are those obviously, if you do it cost per million basis, you know, those costs are going to go down dramatically by what is listed here. But again, just note that there are differences in costs, right? So like there are those, those things come into consideration too. Illumina is still generally the most cost efficient but you have to run a lot of it. Um, so there, there are some uh, costs and benefits of each one of these technologies, and it's just mostly important to recognize that there are differences among them. So uh, when we think about uh, what is um, the result of what we refer to as shotgun genome sequencing, right? And when I mean shotgun, I mean basically that we have you know all these complete copies of the genome uh, we isolate that dna we then uh, break it up into little pieces right we randomly fragment it in some fashion this is what we refer to as shotgun um, so we don't do this with shotguns really we do it um, either by hydro shearing by sonication by enzymatic shearing um, or by you know whatever shearing has occurred naturally within a sample um, so, you know, this is kind of the process that we can do. Um, there are a bunch of different methodologies to do it, but it's important that we want to make sure that it's as random as possible when we do do it. Uh, our next step is, after all, we have all these pieces, is how to assemble them back into those whole segments, right? And, and actually have the sequence for them. So, you know, this is kind of like the old Humpty Dumpty example, right? All the king's horses, all the king's men. How do we put Humpty, Bump, the Humpty Dumpty back into its genome sequence again, right? So, um, obviously, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, say we had a 17 base pair, a set of 17 base pair sequences, right? We might have one sequence, and then we could start uh, adding in these sequences uh, one at a time. And... Um, through that process, you know, we can see where they overlap to each other and align them to each other. And uh, in this, right, we start to see through these overlaps and these areas of consensus, you know, where we have sort of a, what is represented as a longer segment of DNA. So we started with 17 base pair segments and we've assembled it now into a 66 base uh, pair of uh, length, right? And we refer to this um, region, we'll, we'll make one call across all these regions, and we'll refer to that as um, a consensus sequence, right? So this is the consensus sequence for this region. Um, one of the concepts that's important in assembly is that we think about coverage, and so this is the number of reads uh, underlying the consensus. And it's important for us to think about coverage. So the amount of sequencing, basically, the amount of sequence, the amount of evidence that we have to support this consensus call. So if we think about this specific spot, right, this consensus call was, call was a G. We've got six X coverage, so six different data points, basically, showing that this is a G at this position based upon this assembly, right, based upon this align, this uh, uh, overlap consensus approach and we have 100 percent identity so you know we, we would probably be relatively confident of the fact that this is a g in that position right um if we go to another spot we might we might go over here to where there's this a called and note that we have um four a's here we've got five x coverage on this position we've got four a's and one c so we've got about 80 percent identity would we be more confident or less confident in this call than this one over here, this previous G, um, probably be more confident in this one, right? Because this one we have less uh, uh, coverage and we have a lower uh, percent identity at that position, 
Um, doesn't mean that we're not confident that it's an A, but we'd probably be less confident. As we continue to move out, you know, what about here in this position? Is this a C or a G? Well, we've only got two reads. One's a G, one's a C, right? So it's kind of a crapshoot whether or not we called it a C or not, right? Could have just have been easily been a G. Um, and then, of course, we have spots where we have only one X coverage. And here, basically, we have no validation that this is the correct call. We could have an error. And that's what you might be looking at here. You could be looking at errors, so reads that um, there was just an error in the sequencing. Or maybe that's real. That's a, a region of the genome, which is um, heterozygous. Or maybe this is a read which is misplaced. It's in the wrong spot. Right? So there's all these kinds of areas of uncertainty, and um, by getting good coverage of our genome, we're able to overcome over, over, uh, that. Um, once we, we can uh, then take all the reads from sequencing runs, like we can assemble them into sort of longer contiguous segments. Um, and uh, that's kind of been our goal for now, right? And so to get to this point where we have enough information, where we can have these high coverage, high confident genomes, right? We've basically seen that we've needed a lot more sequencing. It's one of the reasons why, you know, the human genome originally cost $3 billion is because we were using some of these uh, capillary based systems um, which couldn't produce that much, that much sequence per day. And we needed that coverage to have confidence in what that genome assembly was going to be. So, you know, around the 2000s, we were still dealing with this capillary system. So it was slow going and it was incredibly uh, costly to get the kind of confidence we needed to put together a genome sequence. Um, and before that, I mean, just forget about it. Gel sequencing was painful. Um, at least so I'm told. I actually never had to do it myself. Uh, so, um, but then, you know, around about the mid 2000s, we had the advent, the late 2000s, we had the advent of our first incidences of massively parallel sequencing, and then the advent of short sequencers, and then where we are right now is moving into a space where things like single molecule sequencing are becoming a reality. I mean, they, are, they already are occurring. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And the amount of, of sequence we're able to generate per day per machine is just uh, incredible. And even the technology that's involved in these machines and uh, what they look like now is just incredible. So we've seen incredible technological growth over this time period. So let's talk about the origin of sequencing, because I think one of the interesting things about the story of sequencing is we do see, you know, very particular innovations occurring within um, this within sequencing technologies. Um, however, um, we don't necessarily um, we don't necessarily see like them passing off on old technologies. Like a lot of things are sort of reinvented or innovated, like previous approaches. And uh, it's just, I, I think it's, it's very instructive to see how this whole process has kind of evolved and is influenced by its history. So we'll start with, with Sanger and even talk a little bit about 454 and then we'll deal with some of the more modern uh, sequencing platforms. Um, so initially for Sanger sequencing, when, after we would fragment these segments, um, we actually had to clone our fragments. So we had to take them put them into a uh, bacterial plasmid vector, and then we would um, uh, take that vector, we'd um, zap it into bacteria, um, we'd get millions of copies of that bacteria, we'd then get rid of the bacteria and keep the plasmid, and then we'd have millions of copies of the plasmid, right? And then uh, we would go through and sequence each of those plasmids. Now. We had to do that for every single one of these fragments. I mean, we've got, when we're doing the human genome, you know, that's three billion bases long. Those fragments are about 600 base or 1,000 base pairs long. I mean, it was a lot of clone sequencing, and you don't really know what's in that clone. So, you know, you just had to keep on sequencing and sequencing and sequencing. And uh, you can imagine to get any sort of decent coverage, 10, 20, 50x coverage, you know, how much cloning you'd have to do. In addition to that cloning, for every single time you wanted to do a sequencing reaction, you had to, um, it, it's like doing a PCR, 
um, but a little bit different. So we had to do a reaction for like every single one of these uh, 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 plasmids. And um, the interesting thing about this reaction uh, is that um, it's a it's a terminal reaction. So basically, instead of it's like a PCR. It's like a PCR, except that um, it uses uh, only a single primer, and um, the polymerase is just making a new single-stranded DNA. Um, and it includes all the normal bases that we normally have, except it's got these uh, dideoxynucleotides worked in. So you've got regular nucleotides, and then you've got dideoxynucleotides, okay? So there are these nucleotides that have been um, chemically manipulated to um, be different from regular ones. Uh, so they're labeled. They have these terminators associated with them. So once they get integrated into a DNA strand, that stops the strand from continuing to be replicated. And uh, if we think about how this works, it's a pretty interesting system. So this is the old fashioned Sanger sequencing. So you would have um, a primer sequence, right? It would come in, it would bind to your, to your, to your DNA sequence. And you have this, all this unknown stuff after your primer sequence. And what would happen right is that um, you'd come in and you'd start putting in uh, you know adding in nucleotides adding in nucleotides and then by chance just by random chance you'd put in a dideoxy T right and this has a label has a, a like a color tag associated with it it terminates the chain and so now you've got one sequence that's 21 base pairs that you know ends in a T right so you know it's 21 base pairs long and you know it ends in a T you go bring the primer back in, you do the same thing. Uh, this sequence ends in a C, right? So now you've got a 26 base pair read that ends in a C. And then you do it, you get a 22 base pair that runs in an A, you know, a 12 base pair that ends in a G, etc., etc. So we acquire all these different um, DNA fragments, each with a different, with a base. Who, uh, that's identified that we know is in that last position and the length of that thing, right? So in the end, we don't really know the stuff in between, but we know the thing that's at the end of that segment and we know how long it is. Then what you do is you feed it through a laser reader and um, basically what happens is uh, you run a gel. And so the short stuff goes first, the long stuff comes next, so you know exactly what size everything is. And then you know what the last base of that thing is. And you're able to build what's referred to as an electrophoretogram or chromatogram. And this, based upon the colors and the peaks observed through this laser reader, tells you, you know, the order of the sequences that you have here. Um, and that's what modern uh, Sanger sequencing looks like, right? And so we still do this sequencing. We use it all the time. But this is where this information comes from, right? If you've ever seen one of these things, this is how we actually... Um, almost always, this is why we always had to look at sequencing data in the past. Um, and keep note that there's this color system, right? There's this four color system. Um, G is black, C is blue, A is green, and T is red. So uh, that was what we had to do uh, for Sanger sequencing. This is a picture from the, um, where they sequenced the human genome. And you notice there's just endless number of Sanger sequences there because it took a lot of machines to do that effort. Um, some things to understand here is Sanger's sequencing is very limited. It's very reliable, but it's very limited. In this case, you had to pick one colony uh, for ev every sequence, which took a lot of effort to generate all those colonies. And you had to have two reactions. You had to sequence both the forward and reverse direction of that colony. You had to do a DNA prep. Um, for each of uh, for each re of those reactions for every colony, right? You had to do a PCR for each of those reactions. So you had to amplify each of those reactions, and then you had to have uh, you had to run it on a gel, right? And um, uh, afterwards, and so you know it's just a lot of steps. Like it's really lab intensive. Um, so it took a long time and a lot of effort to do this kind of work. So what came next? New platforms, right? Sequencing platforms, though. So uh, I'm calling this the this is the present, but really uh, we we're, we're sort of more in the second generation now. So 
This probably should be referred to as first generation at this point. Um, so shotgun sequencing by uh, was the next sort of advent, and um, the kind of technology here is used on w what is known as the ion torrent PGM uh, and the 454 machine. And neither one of these are probably the most commonly used platforms anymore, especially 454. Um, but I do actually think there's some benefit to learning about the technology because I think it does a good job of explaining how we went from Sanger to the next step. So this is kind of the next step of what we did. Um, and the next step um, was basically after we had our shotgun reads is to try to figure out how to sequence each genomic fragment in parallel. Okay, so that was the, that was the big advance of the next step. And the way that it did that is it added on some adapters. So we would take each each step and we would ligate on or um, uh, use PCR in some cases to put adapters onto the ends of these genomic fragments. I think initially it was mostly ligation how we did it. Um, sometimes uh, we would put a little barcode in, right? And this would allow us to say if we had two pools of genomic fragments, we could barcode them for different samples. So we could say this is sample A, barcode number one is associated with sample A, and then we could have barcode two associated with sample B. Right. So that's the idea. Right. And, and what happened is you would have this pool of DNA of DNA fragments, each with adapters on both ends and, and barcoded for their specific sample. And we would have these beads. Right. And and you'd have these beads uh, in a solution, you know, millions to however many beads in your sample. Um, and on the bead were these adapters, these complementary sequences that were attached to these beads. Um, and the idea was that each bead should be amplified all over with a single member of the library, right? So that you'd get one sequence stuck to a bead and then we'd get lots of copies of that sequence on that bead. And how we did that is basically you had these, se these sequences that were attached to this bead. You also had an adapter attached to the end of your sequence and um, the two would line up, they'd hybridize, and then you'd be able to make copies of this thing all, all over this bead. And um, how you do this, you know, is you take the beads, you take the, the stuff, and you'd all put it into the same solution. But, you know, how do you PCR or amplify each of these fragments without having to use one ter two for each reaction? Uh, they came up with a very clever solution, and that was to put them all into oil. Right, and so now within each little oil droplet was a reaction, but the goal was to get one sequence and one bead in each reaction, each little droplet of oil. And, and that of course is challenging. Sometimes you're gonna end up with two, sometimes you're gonna end up with none, sometimes they're not gonna go into droplets. So this is one of the big things that came up and, and we were referred to this kind of PCR as an, as an EM PCR or an emulsion PCR. Um, and it was, I mean, it's a pretty cool idea. And basically what happens is once you get them in there, you know, all the components of a PCR reaction were already in solution. So they're all in this droplet. So basically, you know, now you can get your um, read attaching to your bead. Uh, it's gonna make a copy and then it attaches to another spot. It's gonna make a copy. And then, you know, you get end up with a whole bunch of copies on every bead, right? And um, so you can go through wherever there's one copy and one, one fragment and one bead, you get uh, the same on each one of these, right? And then if you have multiple copies, you might end up with multiple reads on your, bead, on your beads, right? So you have more than one sequence. Then you get rid of the oil. Now you get rid of the oil. You wash away all the stuff that doesn't have sequences, right? Um, that doesn't have stuff attached to it. Um, and then you take all these beads so now you just are left with the beads. Most of them have hopefully your one sequence attached to them all over, you know, amplified. Some of them might have multiple, some of them might have nothing. And then you, what you did is you, you had a plate and you put the beads into the wells of the plate, right? And once you had the beads in the wells of the plate um, and basically those beads were, those, those wells were only big enough to hold one bead, um, uh, and then what we saw was sort of like for a while innovation was hey but how many more bees can I fit on a plate that was kind of how they they increased the yields of sequences um, and, and uh, once you have them in that plate then it would undergo something that we refer to as pyro sequencing right and pyro sequencing was basically this process 
by which at some point during the sequencing reaction, as the sequence strand was growing, it would release uh, a, a pyrophosphate. And this pyrophosphate um, would interact with uh, luc luciferase and create uh, in a little flash of light, right? And so what happened um, is you, instead of the previous thing where we would, you know, uh, give a bunch of, you know, we would sequence one spot as we go along and build the sequence. In this case, what happens is we would take the whole plate and we would wash it with a nucleotide. So we'd wash it with T's, right? So if the next spot on that, uh, you know, if, if there was if there was a spot for the nucleotide to be incorporated on a read, that T would bind, and if it would bind, it would there were enzymes that would then in turn produce a light. So here, you know, at this position, there, you know, the C is not going to bind to a T, so there's basically no light produced. So we wash it with the next base A, no light produced, right? Um, wash it with the next base G, light produced. Right, so now we've got uh, our first example, right? So we've got we got a little bit of light produced if we get a G in there. We go through, we keep washing. T light produced, right? C light produced. Notice we get to the next one, two A's. Now we get two T's. We get twice as much light light produced, right? And that's how we start to sequence these sequence. We get three G's, we get three times as much light produced, right? And the power of this method was that you could do this. You had these really powerful cameras looking down, watching these patterns of flashing lights, right? And able to sequence millions of wells, millions of sequences all at one time by watching these flashings of light, right? And it was, it was really impressive. I mean, when it first came out, uh, it was just, it, it was, I mean, this was revolutionary for us. I mean, we've been sequencing one sample at a time, and now by looking at, you know, images of these slides, we could sequence so many more uh, things at one time. Um, like I said, there were other sequences that build, built on this type of idea of a well, right? Um, ion torrent system was another well-based system where you had this chip um, that had an ion-sensitive layer underneath it, and um, so it was built not on light in this case, but more looking at um, uh, ion fluctua fluctuations or changes in pH. And so ion torrent sequencing um, came about, uh, this is what uh, uh, one of these uh, chips looked like. They were, I mean, they're, they're, the ion torrent still exists. I find it to be um, uh, not the easiest technology to use or, or the most reliable for a variety of reasons, um, it's not my preferred one, um, but it was a really interesting system and kind of relates to some later stuff that, that we'll see. If we think about the ion torrent system, um, it does do some unique things. And then you can start to see some similarities too with the previous technology. Um, and I think you'll see it sort of pop up a little bit later too. Um, but let's, this is a little promotional video. They, they do a better job of explaining this stuff than I do. I mean, they're paid professionals, they're great at this. Um, I am just your average biology professor, but um, let's watch this video and then I can kind of interject my, my two cents into it. Next generation sequencing is a powerful technology which can interrogate many targets at the same time, from just a few genes to all of the individual nucleotides in a whole genome. Ion Torrent technology from Thermo Fisher Scientific takes an entirely new approach to next generation sequencing, making it massively scalable, faster, simpler, and more affordable than ever before. The sequencing of DNA is done using a semiconductor chip, similar to the chip found in your digital camera. While the chip in your digital camera has a sensing layer covered with millions of pixels that translate light into digital information, an ion chip has millions of wells covering those pixels. These so again, this is similar to that idea I said before, where you had like this camera looking down on this slide. In this case, you have a chip with the sort of um, sensors actually embedded into the chip on the bottom of it. Wells capture chemical information from DNA sequencing and translate it into digital information or base calls. And again, they're using 
chemical information instead of visual information in this case. The sequencing process starts when a sample of DNA is cut up into millions of fragments. Each fragment then attaches to its own bead and is copied until it covers the bead. Similar to what we saw in 454, right? We have this bead-based approach. Read attaches to the bead and then it's amplified all the way. That one sequence is amplified all the way around the bead. So lots of copies of the same sequence on each bead. This automated process covers millions of beads with millions of different fragments. These beads then flow across the chip, each depositing into a well. Then the chip is flooded with one of the four DNA nucleotides. Whenever a nucleotide is incorporated into a single strand of DNA, a hydrogen ion is released. This is how the ion torrent system sequences. So again, right, it's flowing one base, it flows the next base, it flows the next base. So it's the same process that we saw in 454. But in this case, instead of producing those pyrophosphate groups and utilizing luciferase, this case, they're actually producing hydrogen ions. DNA. The release of the hydrogen ion changes the pH of the solution in the well. An ion-sensitive layer beneath the well measures that change in pH and converts it to voltage. This voltage change is recorded, indicating that the nucleotide was incorporated and a base was called. In essence, each well works as the world's smallest pH meter. So you flow across a C, it bumps up to one, you know that a C got incorporated. You flow across a G, it bumps up to two, you notice that two Gs got incorporated. That kind of idea. The process is repeated every 15 seconds with a different nucleotide washing over the chip. For example, cytosine. A polymerase incorporates the C nucleotide in the DNA strand if a complementary G molecule is present. If the nucleotide is not complementary to the next base, no ion is released, no voltage change is recorded, and no base is called. If there are two identical bases next to each other, two nucleotides are incorporated, the voltage doubles, and the chip will record two identical bases called. This process happens simultaneously in millions of wells. That's why it's often described as massive parallel sequencing. The ion chips help you scale the workflow to your research needs so that you can run both small and large-scale projects without the need to change platforms. And the semiconductor approach helps you implement a significantly faster NGS workflow. There are many possible research applications with NGS. From whole genome sequencing to identify association of genomic variation with different diseases, to targeted NGS, where the whole power of NGS is used to interrogate a defined number of targets with possible significance in the pathogenesis. Ion Torrent Technology from Thermo Fisher Scientific harnesses the power of targeted NGS. So, uh, you can start to see the, um, the, how influential uh, this type of technology is. Um, one thing that I think is, is notable, and I probably should have written this slide, but it's actually really important to emphasize here. Um, Ion Torrent, um, Oxford Nano, well, Oxford Nano Port to a point, and um, 454 sequencing all struggle a little bit with one specific problem, and this is because of the kind of ways that they sequence. So Ion Torrent, 454, right, whenever, how are they calling what we refer to as homopolymers or regions of DNA that are all the same, like AAA, CCCC, TTT, GGGGGG, regions where you have one base repeated uh, multiple times. How do they do that? They do it by a uh, estimating what the effect looks like for um, twice as much light or twice as much change in pH. Unfortunately, these systems don't always uh, do that very well, especially when it's really long, right? Because like when something gets so bright, it may just be too bright for your camera to really be able to estimate effectively exactly how many copies were in a, in a row. And the same thing with pH. So the, these, all these technologies are prone to errors where there are these homopolymer issues. So uh, wherever homopolymers exist in sequences. So it's something to understand. It's a, it's a big issue when we think about some of the downstream applications, but knowing that these technologies differ and are biased towards specific errors is a really important uh, thing to recognize.